pray that you will this morning just surrender our hearts. There is an enormous amount of equation now and it will easily look at the world with physical eyes of these eyes. Lord, I just pray that we will just take a sign for you. I wonder why we struggle sometimes to really live out the fact that you've got everything in control. And uh, yeah, just open the heart this morning. Just gather our worship. Pray that the Spirit will just feed you. Pray that will. It's like Paul said, this is me, that, I'll be, that I may be empty. So that they will not distract from your cross. That they will not take away from your cross. So Father, I pray that it will be less of me. It's not about the eloquence in which this, this word is delivered. Because Lord, when, when we open the Bible, you speak. When we open the word, it is your spirit at word in our hearts. And I pray that I follow Paul's example. He said he didn't come to you people with elegant speech or with trickeries or and we so with our physical eyes fall prey to that Lord. Even us as pastors, we want to be presenting this in the best way, but it's a very thin line. And we judge ourselves and we get judged by the way we deliver. And Paul felt the same amount of pressure. So nothing has changed over the last two thousand years. And if we don't deliver, we want to add more witchery and trickery and all kinds of bits of fuss and we add media and all that, and we just in itself are wrong, Lord. But if it's done wrongly, with the wrong intent, we will distract from the cross. My purpose here today is to point at Jesus, at His blood, the fact that we're covered by His blood, the fact that we are rebellious and we want to do our own way, we get burned. But this is the hospital. This is a spiritual hospital where we can have surgery, open heart surgery this morning. And allow Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to operate. May we reignite our hearts. Amen. Now friends, seeing that you can see I'm getting more and more like Moses, going through the Ten Commandments. So this is my Moses impression. And um, at least my, I mean, Moses had a maybe a 40 year head start on me. So I you know, need to grow yet, but nevertheless, you yeah, man. Uh, we, as I said, we, we go through the Ten Commandments and we go through them, we're saying that we've been set free by Jesus, but we often are not living free. We often are in track by whatever we feel you know, with our physical eyes and well, sometimes we look at the Ten Commandments and we think, well, you know, God said, this is what I have to do, have to, have to do, and we have this like a shopping list and feeling is God judging us and, you know, what we want to see is that to bring us to the point where God is speaking us through His Word to be rejoicing that Jesus is the answer to the shortfall, but also how are we fitting, how does, how does the law fit into our world in the 21st century? So that's what it's all about. We've done the first commandment, and the first commandment we have, we have the first and second commandment. The first commandment is who we are to serve. God wants to be the single object of our worship. He wants, He's the object of our worship. And then following on, on the second commandment, last week we start on how uh, God wants to be worshipped. And it's amazing when I, as I'm preparing that, I can see how the second one ties into the third one. Um, as you know, if you've got the how one, but how does it look like in terms of relationships? But it's just amazing to see how all of this is beautifully crafted and knitted together. So this morning, or last week, we did the second commandment, but we came halfway. So we said, the first part said, and there's the reading uh, there from the verse. It said, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not go down to them or worship them. And we pause there. Part one last week we said, image in itself is not wrong. So you don't need to throw out all your beautiful paintings and things as yet. It's the condition that comes <coughs> out and says that you shall not go down to them or worship them. And we spend quite a bit of time in explaining how an idol, anything can be an idol. Anything that 
that, that you channel your energy towards, that becomes your object of worship, that becomes your functioning God. And that could be anything. It could be food, it could be your kids, it could be your mom, it could be your dad, it could be work, it could be whatever becomes more important, whatever sort of takes that place of security. If you say, you know, what's, what, if I only had my problems would go away. Whatever that angel is, if it's not Jesus, it's called the idol. That's a sad reality. Think about it. <laughs> if, it's, if, that, if you don't feel Jesus in there, <laughs> it's probably an idol. There's no negotiating around that. I thought about it this last week and in the past week, and I thought, oh, you know, maybe I can put it in there and say, well, oh, maybe. We try to treat that. But the reality is, God's terms, and I look, if He's not the single object of my worship, whatever is with place is an idol. I, I cannot explain it any other way. That's, that's the reality. But what happened last week, we said part one, we um, talked about um, images and idols, and then I said, I probably wanted to have images, idols, and then I add on imagination, which is a weird word to use. But we, the second part today, is talking about the character of God and the disciples are talking about his jealousy and his demonstration of him. So today is continue about imagination and talk about and this is where we're going to spend time on today is to understand the second part where he said there um, for I am the Lord your God am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. How many of you have read that from, you know, maybe when you're young? When I grew up, I find that part hard to understand. I find it troublesome. I sometimes thought, God, you are you're making me unfair. You know, you're punishing me for my dad's sin. That's basically what it says if you read it that context. If you read it like that, it says there, you know, I am the Lord your God and jealous God, which is fine, punishing the sin, the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. But since then, and I'm like, I, I've really, I've really seen it in a, in a, in a whole new line, I, and I hope to share what I've found in this word, which is free in understanding in the context. And basically, what I say, there is two things in this today. There's two sections that we're gonna we're gonna split this up in two parts as well. And the first talks about the image that is used to imagine the, the, the body of Christ, which is the marriage. That's what the, the image that is used, that the first part. So we're gonna we look at the first thing, the Lord your God and the jealous God. That's the first. And the second part is what the, so the first part is what I call jealousy makes you nasty. And then the second part is called Monkey see, monkey do. When we speak Great Commission, we go straight to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. But really, it's in the command, it's right there. The discipleship. This is the, I'll explain to you when we get to the second part. But to me, I, this is discipleship. Just hang on, it's coming. So. Let's go back. Let's start with the ball. We start there, and I want you to read with me there. He said, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now look at that word. Now, when the Bible, when God speaks and the way that he spoke, there is an important word there because he just told us how he wants to be worshipped. Remember, he said, you shall not make an image and bow down to them. So you shall not make anything else more important. You shall not make anything else an act of worship, an object of worship. We can even worship, worship. But then he goes on and he explains that. And it's, that's one of the things. You know when you talk to your kids or your friends sometimes, you say that, that you know, they ask you, you know, why are they not allowed to go to that party or do this? And you just say, well, you know, I told you you're not going to that party. And then the reason is for or because I said so. That's our explanation and that's it. You're not that... I got, I, I'm not giving you a reason because I said so. The wonderful thing about the our Heavenly Father is He doesn't operate that way. He doesn't just say, look, you shall not make an image and you shall not bow down because I said so. He could have done that. But He 
Look, he says the word for. I love it when he put a word like that in for and this. It gives you a reason of why. He's now going to explain to us why he is saying that he's the only object of worship. He is going to explain his character on the one hand and the way that he sees that taking place as a result. That's the two things that he is going to explain to us in this second command. So, let's start right there. Jealousy makes you nasty. You know there's a song, I don't know if you guys have heard he used to say, Jetsy makes you nasty. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a term that they were saying is that, you know, you know, talking about jealousy. Um, we do tend to have a very, very weird connection with the word jealous. And I think sometimes we confuse that with covet. You know, oh, he's just jealous. Or, you know, when you put it out as almost as a term as today, is that jealousy is not a, you know, it's a very over-the-top type of thing when you think about marriage or when you think about relationship or you, in whatever way, you know, when you use the word jealous, it's used with a human baggage. It's like, you know, he is irrational. Ir we think of jealousy as an irrational act. It's like, this is the way that we should honor one another. And someone who is jealous is like this plus more. Now the, the weird thing is, with that baggage, remember we all read the word, we all listen to the word, we all do things in a way from an angle. So when we read the Ten Commandments, when we read the Bible, we hear the word, I am a jealous God. And what we see is this crazy spouse who is uh, checking up on your emails, who is, you know, uh, checking your text, who has uh, got a PI, and he's got, you know, he's got all the, that's, that's, I don't know about you, but my mind, maybe I'm just a conspiracy mind person, but when I hear the word jealousy, when I think, you know, that's, that's the background, that's how I, that's what I see. I mean, we've watched enough television and movie shows to, to really show us, you know, how bad jealousy can be, how, you know, how we can drive us to the ground. And, the question I ask myself is that, is this what God is saying when He uses the word jealousy here? I, I don't think so. When God is saying, I'm a jealous God, He uses, Jesus uses an example of marriage. You know, spouse. He uses an example of that relationship between two people. That's when he puts that together and he says, look, this is what I want to show you. This is the way I want to see this relationship. I'm a jealous God. Now just, you know, as a practical example, you know, I mean, think of your own spouse. Or, oh, but, I mean, I can, I can just imagine how glad I'll be on my wedding day when my weekend, waltzing down the aisle with her, with a boyfriend. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I'll be uh, not only upset. When you think about that, when you think about your, you know, you're in this relationship, what is the way that you want to see that? Is that something that you, that's, that's open for input? Open it. Would you come home and say, you know what, I don't mind sharing uh, my spouse with, uh, you know, someone because, you know what, in the 21st century, we're not supposed to, you know, be dark. Okay. We're not supposed to be light, heavy minded or jealous. We've got to be embracing this new kind of a, I mean, how many people do that? moment and say, oh, um, you know, <laughs> what I want to show you, what, what, what God is saying when He says, I'm a jealous God, He's saying, it's an exclusive relationship. When He uses the word, He says, for I'm a jealous God, just think about the way that He describes it. It is that He, the image is between Him and us. He's the bridegroom who is His bride. He, God spoke through Moses, and remember that, that the Israelites here were 400 years were slaves. They were away from God. They, they did their own thing. They stole. They coveted. All those kinds of things. It was alive and well. And here they are now in a point where God is saying, well, the relationship that I want to have with you, this is a covenant. <laughs> Marriage is a covenant between those two people. He said, look, the way that I want to have this relationship with you is exclusive. 
Nothing else. No one else. You, me. That's all. Imagine how, and, I, and I'm not trying, and I know we, that a wonderful past we had, but you know, when you have in your past, you think about that, that when that relationship was distorted, the amount of pain that flowed on from that was just tremendous. And God is saying, what I want from you, the way that I want this relationship to be, is to be exclusive. And remember when I say, when He talks about blasphemy, it almost adds on and saying, well, would you go around, you know, bad mouthing your spouse? Or would you go on, just dipping into the third commandment here, go around, you know, and you hear, you know, the room next door saying, you know what? His wife is such a... Would you go and say, yeah, um, you know, that's actually right. Yeah? No. <laughs> if someone bad mouthed my wife, even I would virtually storm in and maybe do the wrong thing, but I'll, I'll make my case known. You will not bow my bad mouth, my wife, and I will I will not stand idly watching it gone past. Because this is an exclusive relationship. I love my wife. And therefore I will defend my wife. She doesn't need defending. She's strong enough. But still. God doesn't need defending, but it's the relationship, it's the response of. But look, I'm not in the third commandment yet, I'm just saying, and you see how it ties on to the next thing. Just to come back to this exclusivity. Well, without me, boys and girls would say, it's, I see love is an exclusive relationship. Love is, a, is climaxing in a holy covenant called marriage. And again, now I'm living on to the later ones. If you think you can serve God, but you are fooling around, not only sexually, but in coveting, in all these other commands. You see, we can easily just get, you know, we go around sex with, but it's, you know, stealing, coveting, lying, all those kinds of things are, just, are in the same thing that you are now almost committing adultery in your relationship. Because you are distorting this exclusivity. The Word of God is the bridge between God and us and people and us created beings. And I say that because what God is saying to the Israelites is saying, I want to have this exclusive relationship with you. This is, this is what I have. And because I am the created God, you are my created beings. This is the terms which I know the best for you. Like, again, a father who knows better for his son. You know, if I see my... Stephen, run out that door, I will stop him because I will limit his freedom, which you might mean, but I will do so because I love him. Let me just use an example from, from the word. And I want to jump because now it's, a, it's actually quite practical. Because now you see Israel, they got their Ten Commandments and they're all good. And they say, yes, Lord. Just before they came, they said, yes, we will serve you. We all, we honor this exclusive relationship. Lord, this covenant is the best thing ever. You know, I, well, I don't think there were slight breaks back then. So, But it's, it's just the best. Jump on to Exodus 34. And in between Exodus 20 and Exodus 34, <laughs> What happened? Israel decided, hmm, Moses is not coming back. Well, let's see how we can worship God in a better way. So they made a golden calf. That's what they've done. They've got this, they've just seen God on mountain. They were too afraid to come close. They received the word, they received the law, and the next moment they made their own calf. Can you see how quickly they fall into their sin of saying, okay, Lord, you know what? I love this covenant thing. But you know, I like this adultery thing as well. And I think that we can sort of merge these two. And because if you're happy with this, we're all happy. And it's again, you know, sharing my wife. It's just not going to happen. But we don't see it that way. You see, we look at them and we say, Israelites, how stupid can you be? 
And I want to say, the problem of 20, our 21st century living is that we get spiritual snobbery. We look at them and we think, they're stupid. <laughs> Guess what? We do. Yes, we didn't make a golden calf. But our golden calf can look at any different shapes. But it's still there. Our hearts are idol factories. I mean, the prophet Isaiah, he said, he when he fall, he was forced, God said, to go marry an adulterous wife. Just do it. But I want to show you, I want to take you to this, he says that if, and there's a word in verse, verse 14, he said, do not worship other God for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Now that's an interesting statement, because it describes the character of God. God is saying, my name is jealous. This is who I am. And we might immediately respond and say, well, Lord, you're a bit over the top, don't you? But I want to say that the word jealous equals the word righteous, equals the word love, equals the word dependable, equals God. You see, we cannot fully describe God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We use this word. We use words to try to put his attributes into place as to get a picture of who God is and God is revealing himself and he's saying to Israel one of the things is I am love when the New Testament we describe that love we now sometimes go and say well because Jesus you know he said his love love in our world is meaning hippie style we love all do all do everything you want you know God is good I don't have to do anything else you know fly up the Ten Commandments do all these kind of things but that's all what love is, because love translating back the God, is the Father that we serve, is still the same God. He's still dependable. For Him to be dependable, it means love, to be righteous, to be all these things, which He says here, I am a jealous God. You know what the funny thing is? How much of the New Testament is already here in the Old Testament? Because Moses is a type of Jesus. And you see, just go rewind back and he bowed down from verse 8. Now look, Israel screwed up. Big time. Verse 8, Moses now is negotiating. He is negotiating. He is mediating between God and Israel. God just mean, said, look, mate, I found a number of these guys. Mate. I'm just giving you two tablets. And again, we don't know if it's iPad or Android. Um, and they went on and pulled a calf. God says, don't make an image, they make an image. In the same breath. And God has said, listen, man, that's it. And Moses goes up to God. And he said, he bowed down to him. He said, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, let, let, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff thing, people, forgive us our wickedness and our sin. And take us as your inheritance. And then he says, I make a covenant with God, the Lord said, I make a, I am making a covenant with you. I will, before all your people, I will do one that's never before done in any nation in the world. The people you live among will see how awesome it's work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. And then he goes, what he will see. But you see, we get close to this. Even us today, even in this, you know, Growing this chest, you come to this point, and then all of a sudden you take your eye off the eye of the prize, your foot off the pedal, and you get burned because you feel all of a sudden, wow. And God is saying, Look, we're doing all these great things because I'm a jealous God. All, all you need to do is obey and love me back. Keep this exclusive. So, with the golden calf, I have to just make a few things about this exclusivity and the difference between that and an idol. One of the things I don't like about an idol, an idol is like a cool ring. You know? It's happy to be shared. Yeah? An idol just wants to sacrifice. As long as you feed the idol, it's happy. That's it. And he doesn't mind. You can have 10 idols. It's like a dog. You know? Yeah, you can have more dogs. You can have, you know, it's all those things. It's that, you know, an idol is happy. To be, as long as you feed it, it's happy for you to have more. He doesn't mind. But it's an exhausting, never ever satisfying. But you'll never get to a point where you say, wow, you know, like all those games. Yes, I have achieved what I, I've accomplished what I came out to achieve. Because once you're there, 
It's an emulation, it's an outbreak. Can I say that only Jesus became the, the image of the invisible God? Only Jesus is the solution. Only Jesus can truly satisfy. John Piper said, Christ is most glorified through us when we are the most satisfied in Him. At the end of this first section, the call is back to whatever thing, whatever problem you have in your life, Jesus is the answer. But it's not just information transferred today. Go to the Word and see how God is speaking to your lives and see in what way the relationship is still exclusive. And the Spirit will show us. Spit my bit. Again, don't go idol hunting because that is an idol in itself. <laughs> There's a difference. Like in the old days, people were beating themselves up and all this. It's not working. And Luther did that until he finally found that he was saved by grace. The next point, monkey see, monkey does. This is a hard part because the second part there in Exodus 20 takes us to the point where it says that you know, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Who of you have heard that song? That song gave me tears long before I had children. It says, catch in the cradle. So I'm going to be like you, Dad. I'm going to be like you. Have you ever heard that song? Um, I was trying this morning again, but it says like, you know, my boy came out to play. And I said, not today. Lots of bills to pay. Uh, but maybe another day. And it goes on and on and on. And you know, it keeps you up. And, you know, and finally, he said, I spoke to my son the other day. And, uh, you know, and I said to him, you know, I'd like to see if you don't mind. He said, Lord, I, I said, Dad, I would love to if I can find the time. You know, the kids are the flu and I've got to work and all this. And then as I hang up the phone, it occurred to me, my boy became just like me. And this is exactly what God is saying when He says punishing. Because Romans 1 tells us that He gives you over. God is a gentleman. He lets people do their own wicked way, whatever way He does, because He made us with free will. And the thing is, it's the punishing part is the result of, it's the consequence of our decisions. God is not punishing me for my dad. He's never done that because everybody's going to stand in front of Judgment Day, in front of God and say, Lord, I've followed you, I haven't followed you, I have followed you, I'm covered by Jesus, I haven't followed you, I'm not covered by Jesus, but they're then on the sake of my own work. And we know how that is. But He is not punishing me for my dad. However, Think about it. When I've got, I have inherited my granddad's magnificent cholesterol. How great is that? I have to, I have to drink Crystal every day. <laughs> Beauty. Of course, Crystal makes it so I can have more unhealthy stuff if you need to. That's a good conversation. But it gets passed on from one generation to the other. All those things are, you know, goes on and on. And I remember. One evening we had a small intimate service and the one guy he came in and he said, you know what, Christianity and all these things is like monkey see, monkey does. And he goes on and said, look, what they see is what is happening. And this is what I want to say to us this morning. This is discipleship in action. When Jesus said you can either serve God or money or mammon, what he is saying is whatever drives your heart, Whatever functional God you have, whichever God is your security, you will make disciples of. You do not become a disciple maker when you are a Christian. Disciple making is not restricted to Christianity. Whatever drives your heart, you make disciples of. Whatever values you have, you will pass on to your kids. It's just how it is. If you ever Listen to your kids, have you? <laughs> oh, you, 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 and then think about, wow, is that how I sound? In any case, the Great Commission is right here. Because God, what, what he's saying here is that when people have moved away from God, that gets passed on to their kids, gets passed on to their kids. And the challenge here, here, is that, you know, it's, it's the challenge is to say, but those who love me 
I will love and then know. I will show love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Can you hear the echo of the Great Commission? Make disciples and teach them to keep my commandments. Go back to Deuteronomy 6. And it says, love me and keep my commandments. Because the image that they use there, especially in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, is not just like I pass on information to my kids, but it making an impact. You know when you take a big, flat piece of steel when they make a car, and they've got this machine, and it goes down and it makes a, an impact. Once that machine is lifted, it's gone. Basically. It will never be a flat piece of steel again. You can hammer it with it, but it will always be dented. And that's how our relationship with God will influence and impact those around us. Our friends, our family, our moms, our sons, our daughters, our, whoever is around you, you will impact them. Even the check out, check out calls in that brief moment in time will be impacted by what drives your heart. I mean, whatever drives your heart will be imparting onto your children. Your relationship with your work um, um, is exactly what they would hate. Yet, we do. You see, it becomes a default mode. I have seen kids who have been we work in a ministry in the poor side of the city, and they say, I hate being like, I hate being be like my dad. But, you know, and we see them there on the doll, they, they, they've got no ambition or this. Yet, a few years down the track, he's doing exactly the same. The same thing he hates. It's such a default mode. Unless, unless, unless. And that's the beauty of God. We are transformed by the Spirit of Jesus. Oh, I want to say, even in my own life, Growing up, I have inherited the good and the bad from my parents, not only the rest, the rest, but all the other bad bits as well. The way that they had, you know, honored one another, their relationship and the marriage, and then how it broke up, all those things and an influence on me. But funny enough, you can either think, oh well, I'm alright, or you come back and say, Well, transform me so I can be more like you and less like mom and dad. And that in itself is an act of God's transformation of power. You see, when God is saying, and that's the beauty of God, He says that I will punish them from the third and the fourth generation. Can you see it ends there? It says that there is an open opportunity to return back into God. He didn't say, I will punish them for a thousand of generations. That means that it's not back able to come back. No, 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 no. You know, when we are wishing it, there is a possibility of coming back to God. God is so tender, all those kinds of things. Can you see the image? It sort of means we can look at it from a negative way. So why would you punish people? But it's not his intent. You say, <coughs> I desire for people to come to me, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And that whoever stands in judgment day will have no excuse. Isn't that amazing? I think I marvel at that. And when I look at this now, the second part, I see God's love. <laughs> but I also see my rebellion. But you see, because you see what? I love God's love, but I want it my way. That's how we are made. Well, through sin. Of course. So, the challenge for me is that we can have, we can do it all safe. I can do it in all in a, in, a, in a safe way to be afraid to be bold and create a discipleship of you know of people who love Jesus so much that we will stand up for him. But even in in reverting back to it, we can create discipleship of safe zones for generations to come where we all keep ourselves the safe. But the wonderful thing is, is as Paul said, what well, I have found in Jesus, I pass on to you. And so is the essence of this message that God is wanting from us is to share the love with those around us. He is the single object. And if we are living in a single exclusive relationship, what we will pass on, the discipleship, the discipleship or the making of be obedient to God. But only if God Lord, I just thank you so much.
I pray that they will not be in a way with the word today. But just as one verse, two verse, one and a half verses that you will speak to us. And you will, if only we can look at you in a, in a new way, and we can see that as a God of love who is defined by jealousy, is a righteous God which makes you dependable, which makes you reliable, which ultimately makes you God. I pray, Lord, that once again that you will be our single object of worship in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So today we have the wonderful opportunity again to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. And uh, I want to read us as a, a passage as we are inviting one all. This is an invitation that Jesus has left us as a sign after the fact.